You got your uh, football score, babe? <laughs> okay, we're rolling. Right. Speed. Go ahead and tell so that. So, I'm going to tell you about the God Squad. Okay, so my experience with the God Squad is that they are basically Warren Jeff's henchmen, so to speak. And whenever anyone goes into Colorado City, they know you, they recognize you immediately because you have, for starters, a, a different car. This community is so small that they know who everyone is. They know the cars that everyone drives. So if someone comes into the community that has a different car, especially a California license plate, obviously you're a stranger. And so they will actually follow you to make sure who you are, what you're doing, run your plates and all of that. And I was warned that this would be, but this would happen literally as soon as we stepped into town, they would know that we were there. The God Squad knew and they got on the phone and I'm pretty sure they texted the entire community that they're Californians in the community. And so one day we were out shooting but we went to actually to Centennial Park, which is just down the street. It's the second ward, the apostates who started their own religion. And we were driving around Centennial Park looking at these gargantuan mansions that are paid for by welfare. And this car started following us. And at first, Jace, you know, I was there with Jay, and he was like my bodyguard and my tour guide. And we were driving, and we noticed this car following us, and we thought, oh, you know, it's, it's fine, it's fine, we'll make a left turn up here. So we got up to the corner and made a left turn, and the car behind us made a left turn. So we drove a couple more blocks and made another turn, and this car was following us and made another turn. And at that point, Jay's thinking, holy shit, we're being followed. What is the God Squad doing here in Centennial Park? They're only supposed to be in Colorado City. So we're driving, and he said, I know what we can do. We can drive to the airport, this airport that Warren Jeffs built with taxpayers' money that no one ever used, and just another scam to get money out of the government. So we're driving to the airport, and this car is still following us. And then we turned right by the airport, and the car turned right. And at that point, Jay was freaking out, freaking out that they had followed us all the way from Colorado City all the way to Centennial Park and they were following us and he's thinking, oh shit. So the car pulled up next to us and the person started honking and at that point we're both starting to panic, like we're going to start running us off the road because Jay said he has actually been run off the road before by the God Squad. So we would pull over to the side of the road and we see this, hi! <laughs> it was his friend Katie who was totally just messing with us. It was hysterical. At that point, we pulled the car over and just sat there on the side of the road, going, "And I'm gonna kill her when she gets when we get back to her house." <laughs> she was so messy with us. And Jay said, "Do you think she did that on purpose?" And I said, "Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah." Uh, Can you tell me about your own experience with polygamy, where you were born? Show what a good okay. show what a good Beverly Hills doctor can do for you. <laughs> uh huh. Ready to go. All right, great. So um, start start with your name, like who you are and where you were born and where you were raised, the way you were raised and the things that were similar in your background compared to this group. Okay. My name is Victoria Reynolds. I was born in, actually at the time I was born in a place called The Ranch. At the time, my parents were actually one of the first six families to settle this. It was a small community in the mountains of Montana that was settled by a man named Roland Allred. And he... It was another one of those breakoffs of the FLDS, and when Colorado City went through the raid in the 1950s, the All Red Group left and started their own religion. This, of course, is pretty standard in the Mormon fundamentalist thing. If they don't like what's going on here, let's just go start our own religion. So that's why we had these little groups all over the place, and one of the groups I was born in was the All Red Group, and the ranch was their place out in the middle of nowhere where they could go and hide and start their own little thing. <coughs> And so my parents were one of the very first families to settle there. I was actually born on the ranch. I didn't know this until I started doing research. I thought my parents moved there after I was born, but they actually moved there before I was born. And my parents were excommunicated from the Mormon church when I was two weeks old. Not because my dad was a polygamist, although he very much believed in polygamy, but he was excommunicated from the Mormon church simply for consorting with polygamists. But that was a choice that he made. I mean, he basically said, okay, I'm willing to give up my position with the Mormon church to go over here and practice what I think 
is the truth, which in his eyes, the Mormon church had gone astray because they no longer believed in these fundamentalist practices that Joseph Smith had supposedly put into place. So that's where I grew up. It was a very small community. It was very closed. It was about 15 miles away from anything else up in the mountains of Montana. Uh, we had the dairy. We ran the community dairy. And it was completely self-contained. One of the things that the ranch, what they had decided was it needed to be completely self-sustaining so that the government wouldn't be involved. One of the things that was different about the ranch than Short Creek, and Short Creek is now Colorado City. Short Creek is now Colorado City and the ranch is now Pinesdale, Montana. So one of the things they wanted to do on the ranch was have it be completely self-sustaining so that the government basically wouldn't even know we existed. One of the differences is that there was no abuse of the system. Well, one of the things that's, that Colorado City really does is really take advantage of the welfare system. But we were told completely the opposite, which is don't even let the government know we're here. And one of the biggest concerns as a kid was that the government would come and take the dads away. So everyone in the community was uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so. Everyone was family. And that way, if anyone came into the community, no one would know who was related to who. Which we still see and that happens in Colorado City, too. Only everybody is married to everybody else. <laughs> so tell that's one of the biggest differences. Tell us about the things that you would do as a child, like with the, the giant uh, square dances, and, and what, what would you wear? Oh, they weren't even square dances when I was a kid. That was Gentile music. The dances, the, one of the very few forms of entertainment that we had, I mean, the entertainment was, had to be sanctioned, of course, by the priesthood. <clears throat> and once a month we had a community dance, and that's when girls wore their best pioneer dresses. <laughs> and we did our hair up with these little curly cues, and everybody had to have the best curly cues in their hair, <laughs> and the fanciest uh, gunny sack kind of dresses. And the music was, it was all 1800 style music. There was the Virginia Reel, the Four Square, the Waltz, and then there was this one dance that was a special dance that they created just for a man to be able to dance with two girls at the same time. And it was great, it was like this waltz, and he would twirl the two girls at the same time, and then they would switch partners. <laughs> created just for us, just for our once a month dances. And this was the place where you would go to scope out the other people. But that thing that, as I got a little bit older and I went to those dances, it just felt kind of creepy because you could see all these old guys checking the girls out. So it wasn't just, you know, you go to a regular high school dance as the boys and the girls trying to figure out how to get together. This was this creepy old men trying to figure out how to get together with the 12 year old girl. Right. Um, can you say a little bit about um, how you know me as Amber? So, what's your, you met Amber when and um, how you, everybody's connected. Ah, because I'll be able to tell a little bit about me. Okay. Well, I met Amber when I was, uh, to say, my early teens. And one of the things about this particular community, and I think it was kind of why one of the reasons I questioned the belief system, because people were always moving in from the outside world, which we were told we were supposed to be terrified of anybody that came from the outside world, but my God, they were moving into my community every day. It was hard to tell, okay, who's legit and who isn't. So we had these families that would move in and they would stay for a month or two months or a year and then they would just leave. And Amber's family was one of these that came in and it wasn't just Amber, it was Amber and the Lithgows and this other family, like they traveled in a pack of three. <laughs> and they came to our community and they lived in someone's house. Now this is one of the things that's really interesting about these communities is that your home wasn't really your home. You got to kind of borrow it from the priesthood. And if the priesthood said, you need to share your home with this family, you just had to share your home with this family. We had people moving in and out of our house all the time. And Amber's family, and the other family, and the other family, all moved in with another family. And there must have been a hundred people living in this house. Kids everywhere. And I got to be really good friends with the Lithgow family, which was also Amber's best friends. Um, one of the girls' names was Jennifer, 
and Jennifer became my pretty much my only friend at a time in my life when I just wanted to kill myself and I, I had a friend and she ended up being my saving grace so to speak because she was the only person I could talk to and then out of the blue her family just picked up and left her like who who, who moves and leaves their kids but and I, Amber's family did the same thing with her. They just these fam these three families just decided one day, okay, Pinesdale's not for us. Let's go see what the next cult looks like, and they left their daughters just to fend for themselves. And what is the priesthood? The priesthood. Well, I think in most religions, the priesthood is a. It's not a, an organization. It's something that you earn or that you become a part of. It's a blessing of. That, that you earn. Um, now, anything depends on the religion, but in this particular group, the priesthood is also the hierarchy that runs the community. And nothing that happens in that community happens without being sanctioned or approved by the priesthood council and whoever the person is that happens to be in charge of the community. And, he has like the, the lead guy and then he has his counselors and the lead guy pretty much makes the choices and then the, it, it, the, uh, the priesthood is basically the same thing as the dictatorship, so to speak. So can you tell me about, first of all, um, what is the thing that they, what is the biggest fear of most people there and why they stay there first and second if you could talk about what happened with the dogs in uh, Short Creek. Okay. The reason that people stay in these communities is really what I refer to as spiritual abuse, which is that their entire eternal exaltation is dependent on them staying. And a lot of these people, even though deep inside might not believe what they're being told, that fear that, okay, after I die, I'm going to end up in a lesser place, what if, that whole what if. What if this really is right, then I will just take my chances and stay here. As miserable as a human being as I am, I'm going to stay here because I don't want to risk my exaltation by leaving. And under those conditions, you can get people to do pretty much anything you want them to do. Is there something that somebody had you do as a child that made you really unhappy? Yes. Can you talk about that? Uh, you know, I don't really have any fond memories of growing up there. I mean, I hear people talk about how much they loved their childhood, how many great things, fun things they did. I have no fond memories of childhood. Uh, my parents were incredibly strict. One of the teachings that the parents were taught in that community is that it was their responsibility to get their children back to God, to exaltation by whatever means necessary. And that meant whipping your children, beating them, um, putting them in dark closets, whatever it took to submit your children to being children of God. And so the, the amount of abuse, physical abuse, just to keep you in line was tremendous. Uh, you know, I, every time I said anything that was out of line, I would get hit for it um, until I just learned to keep my mouth shut. Hit how with belts? Going. Not me. My dad used his hand, his bare hand, but a lot of the kids in the community, actually some of the kids had to go outside, cut their own willow branches, and bring them back and give them to their dad to whip them with. Um, I remember one time in junior high, I could laugh about this now, one time when I was in junior high, we actually had a bunch of us sitting around in my, in my uh, basement talking about who's dead. Most kids sit around and talk about whose dad has the bed, my dad's better than your dad kind of thing. We were all sitting around comparing my dad's worse than your dad. <laughs> With whose dad gave the worst beatings. <laughs> so, and there were other things. I mean, I, I was molested by someone when I was a little girl uh, who had the priesthood, and because he had the priesthood, it was acceptable. I had uh, my junior high teacher who made passes at me consistently almost every day in school because he liked me and it was okay for him to be hugging me and kissing me in front of the other kids. Uh, and there are a couple of other instances where men attempted to molest me and I managed to wiggle my way out of it. 
but there's so much power. The men have so much power in these communities, and the women are considered less than that. There's really no way to even speak your own mind. So, um, what is the uh, before we go to the dogs? Uh, what is the ranking, and how do black families fit into any of this? <laughs> Black families don't fit into any of this. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, I remember being told as a child, I had never seen a black person. I was 12 years old, that felt like me. And I remember my dad just went going ballistic. Oh, I think the but thing, the, the camera stopped. The counter oh. stopped? No, the camera stopped. I think right in the middle of when Maybe. you started talking about this, this one okay, thing. So started, started yeah. 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 You said it did that, right? Before, that it would stop once in a while? And, okay. Yeah, it's it needs to cool off. It's <coughs> cool it it's cooled itself off, I think, every seven minutes. Okay. I'm trying There's to wonder now exactly when it stopped. Well, well it's we'll okay. We can edit it. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Is it going now? Yeah, it's going now. Okay. I, guess, I think probably, okay. probably when it stopped is around when, because I noticed the thing was in blinking, probably around when she was telling her story about Who's what, the what yeah, what hap what had happened to them like molestation and stuff like that. I think that's when it stopped around uh, there. So we'll, we'll get it that I'll tell that story many times. Okay. Let's <laughs> get it some results then. It's in my book. Okay. Um the oh the the black thing. So I was told as a kid that black people are the children of Satan. And that for even talking to a black person you could go to hell. And that, um, yeah, they represented Satan on earth, and that there is no place for them in heaven, that they will be the servants and slaves of all the white people in heaven, just like they're supposed to be here. <laughs> and uh, that, that was an interesting one to try to overcome, because see, logically I knew that didn't make any sense, but it's really interesting how deep-seated those beliefs can be. And uh, but it can keep yeah. you it can keep you prejudiced for no for, reason for absolutely no reason. Just um, can you tell me, me about the dogs and um, what what happened with all of the dogs in Short Creek? You know that's such a sad story. I astounding to me, but not surprising that uh, Warren Jeffs I think is such a paranoid person that he probably had a fear of dogs himself and he just found an excuse to get rid of all of them because they don't believe that cats and dogs go to heaven anyway so if he had one situation where he was afraid of dogs and there was one child who was hurt by a dog he used that as an excuse to get rid of all of the dogs and it wasn't just all of the dogs it was all of the pets in the entire Colorado City community and I don't know about other FLDS communities but he basically said, these animals aren't going to go to heaven anyway, they're too much of a distraction, we need to kill them all. So he had commanded all of the people in the community to get rid of their pets. And apparently a lot of them took their pets to, they took them out to the roadside and released them into the wild or took them to the pound. But those people who weren't willing to relinquish their pets actually had them taken from them and taken out into the desert and shot. Uh, and I had also heard strangled and dragged, just horrible mutilations and jumper cables yeah horrible things they did to these animals torturing them before they killed them and apparently this is still going on you know when we were just there a few months ago one of the women we were talking to said that some boys had come by and whipped her little her little dogs that she was actually raising she actually had buyers for these dogs and they came and killed her dogs so I, I think that it, what it's done is effectively created such a, f another, it's another level of fear. You create a fear about something. So now you have all these people that are afraid of dogs or afraid of pets, afraid of the repercussion that will come from having pets. It's just another form of control. Speaking of control, Warren has um, Naomi who kept records for him on everything and she was also a witness right there by his side continuing to tell him he's a prophet record everything including his sexual deviant acts. So what do you think about uh, Naomi and 
her her part in all this and how she's not prosecuted. If you could talk about what you think about that. Mm, well, seeing what I've what I've read and what I've seen with the investigation, like Sam Brower's book and what he's written, that I I think she is just as much a psychopath as Warren is. And hmm? who? Oh, Naomi. Sorry. I think that again. yeah, Warren's wife Naomi is just as much a psychopath as Warren is. It's interesting because I think that a lot of the perpetrations of Warren were actually Naomi seducing him to do them, which is really interesting. It's like behind every evil man is a evil woman, <laughs> you know. And this really seems to be the case. And she has mysteriously disappeared, but she recorded all of all of Warren's testimonies and all of his writings and every basically everything that he did. She recorded. What's really interesting is that she is the only one who ever saw or witnessed any of his heavenly visitations. So I wonder how much of those were actually her making them up. Rather than, she would say, this is what you said last night during one of your heavenly visitations. What is his heavenly visitations? Um, I, I don't know if I have the terminology quite right, but it was basically he would go into convulsions and during his convulsions, he would be visited by heavenly beings that would give him revelations from God. And then those revelations would be examples of these particular men need to be excommunicated or these particular women need to be reassigned to these men. His own doctrine, so to speak, that he would get when he was comatose. What's fascinating is that she was the only person who ever witnessed these events. And she supposedly wrote down what he was receiving. What about, can you talk about the baby cemeteries? Tell me about what that is. <laughs> and oh, the baby cemetery, my understanding is that there, is, there are two cemeteries. There's a public cemetery for the people who are worthy of being buried in the public cemetery. And then there's the baby cemetery, and this is for all of the babies and the infants that are stillborn or who die when they're within a few days of birth. Or in the case of one family that we know of, they were actually, their child had to be born there because they weren't worthy of being buried in the regular cemetery. What happened in that story? On that particular one, uh, I believe what had happened is that the, the baby died of natural causes. But because the family, this was a family that Warren Jeffs had excommunicated, that they had gone and dug the, day, the, the grave in the regular cemetery. And then before they had a chance to put the baby in the cemetery, the grave was dug up and another grave was dug off to the side and they were told that that's where they had to put their baby. What is the UEP? The United Effort Plan. My understanding is that this is a trust account. It is um, an organization that's set up to handle the assets of the FLDS. And so all of the homes and all of the land uh, are held in this trust account, and the trust account manages all of the property. When people donate, when, when people live in Colorado City or in a lot of these fundamentalist groups, even like with Pinesdale, the land isn't actually owned by the individual. The land is owned by the trust and you essentially have the rights to live on that land, but the land is never yours. And then the house essentially is indeed that what you're expected to do is buy the house and then will it back over the trust or give it back over to the church. So you actually never have any ownership in your own home or your own property. Is, is that what happened to Ross and, and Lori? Can you talk about the Chatwins and their experience? Uh, Ross and Lori, I'm really not the expert on them, right. but I'll tell you what I know about them was that they had been excommunicated from the FLDS and told that they needed to leave, as a lot of these people are told to leave, and they refused to leave because this was their home and they had invested the money to build this home themselves, but they were told that it was not theirs. And so they actually, they were not the only ones, there actually were a group of people who took this, their cases to court to say, we paid for our houses, we deserve to live here, we don't want to leave. 
Otherwise, they're put out into the coal and have to figure out how to fend for themselves. And so that's what happened with Ross and Lori. They were told they need to leave, and they actually were the first people to stand up and say, no, we're not going to. Right. Can you tell me what happened from um, what, what you would heard that happened with Warren marrying his stepmothers? Oh, yes. Well, before Warren and his revelations, <laughs> he, he, yeah, he had, um, when his dad was dying, his dad was a very old man, and when his father was on his deathbed, Warren took it upon himself to give his dad lots of young wives in preparation for them to be his, because Warren actually, in my opinion, couldn't get a wife of his own. He, uh, his first wife was an arranged marriage. All of his marriages were arranged marriages. He didn't meet or fall in love like most young men do. And he handpicked the girls who would marry his father, thinking at some point that those would eventually become his wives. Now, it was the practice at the time that men could not marry their mother-in-law, their stepmothers, because that's, I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> but for some reason, once Warren became the mouthpiece of God, he convinced people that as the mouthpiece of God, that God said that he was seeding these women on his father's behalf. So they were still his father's wives, but he was fulfilling his father's legacy through his wives who were days earlier his mothers. So he went basically from calling woman Mother Naomi, for example, to his wife Naomi. And, and what are the Lost Boys? The Lost Boys are boys who have been driven out of Colorado City. They are essentially competition. This is one of the issues that I think all of these polygamist communities face, which is the ratio of men and women is pretty much the same. But you have men who are in hierarchy who have supposedly earned the right by God to have more wives. And so the girls as they grow up are picked for the older men. So we have all these young men who the girls would really prefer to be with, I'm sure. But because they're competition, they're actually kicked out with their families and they are basically orphaned. And then you have other boys who just realize how completely ridiculous the whole thing is and they leave on their own accord. But there are a bunch of young men who have no social skills. The only skill they have really is construction, so thank God at least they have something. But they have no social skills no education, and they're forced out into a world they've been told their entire life to fear. And I think that's the hardest part because they're raised from birth being told the world is evil, this world is out to steal your soul, the, world, the Gentiles are out to get you, and that you will go to hell if you go out there in the real world. But then suddenly they're thrust out in there and have to figure out how to navigate it on their own with the assumption that just because they have left, now they are spending an eternity in hell. And the amount of guilt is amazing, these kids are stuck with. How many people do they believe in that group are going to be saved? So 100 it's 144,000. 144,000, that's right. <laughs> Can you tell me about the 144,000, what that is? Uh, well, I think every religion believes that they are the chosen 144,000, <laughs> and that they are the chosen Zion and that everyone else will be wiped off the earth and only 144,000 people will be taken up or yeah, ascended into heaven while everyone else is wiped off the earth. And this comes from um, biblical, I don't know if it's in Daniel or if it's in Revelations, but it was foreseen thousands of years ago that there would be 144,000 people chosen. Mm -hmm. So every religion at least fundamentalist religions believe that they are the 144,000. Can you tell me about the movie that the government made up and told the world that there were men walking on the moon? <laughs> I 
got to love conspiracy theorists. <laughs> There's one for every corner. Um, is this that they were plugging me? Oh, this is totally a conspiracy. There were so many people in these fundamentalist groups, and Pinesdale is one of them, of course, that really believe that so much of what is on the media and so much of what our government tells us is a conspiracy. And one of those conspiracies was that we have never come up, landed on the moon. There were never any spaceships. And that the whole landing on the moon thing was a conspiracy by our government to get money out of us. So there was no such thing as man, men going to the moon? No such thing as men going to the moon. No. And they even tried to deny that there was no such thing as airplanes, but at some point we had to accept the fact that the things flying over and making all the noise were actually man-made. Can you tell me what happened with Warren when he was trying to get the power with the 21 men kicked out of the group and how that political shakeup happened? I'm trying to do this from memory of the book that I read at 2 o'clock in the morning. Or do you want to talk about what blood atonement is? Blood atonement is interesting. I actually didn't even know about it until I read John Krakauer's book. Oh, well, never mind that then. Um, but it makes sense now. I understand why Roland Allred was murdered. Can you talk about how, if people if from the public are allowed in the meeting house, the church? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think this is pretty standard across all of these fundamentalist groups, and especially those that are more cult-like, as with the FLDS, that outsiders are just not welcome. But first of all, we need to consider that, these, that people in these communities consider all outsiders to be Gentiles, and Gentiles are evil, and Gentiles will bring their evil ideas. So they're not welcome in the communities to begin with. And that it's almost like they'll bring their disease of truth into the community or disease of corruption as the communities consider them, but definitely not allowed into the, into the meeting halls or into any of the ceremonies. That would be a corruption of their religion. Um, why is nobody that's born there, why are, are, is everybody in the outside world uh, have impure blood? Why do they believe in inter... Can you just talk about the fact that they just all have sex with each other? They all marry each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your step brother, your sister. And they, they have this belief that's called, um, oh my gosh, I just blanked on it. Pure, we have a pure blood doctrine. It's an actual doctrine where they believe that only certain families are entitled to exaltation. Now, exaltation is this belief that men who have enough wives and who have proven themselves worthy in this life get to be exalted and get to be gods of their own planet in the future. What I find fascinating is that men get to be gods and the women get to be the consorts to gods. They don't actually get to be called goddesses, they just get the privilege of being married to a god. So part of this belief is this pure blood that only those with the right last names marry each other and propagate so that you don't have any outside blood that is breaking down the DNA of basically the, the, the ones who have the rightful place to exaltation and outside blood would, you know, would ruin that whole entire plan. So. So 21 men were ex excelled, expelled from the community all at once in the middle of a uh, day at church. And what, happen what happens to women and the families when men are expelled by Warren? If you could start like at the beginning, like when Warren expels people and okay. how and why? Well, I think Warren expels people because it is a show of his power and his control. And I... It's interesting that he chose the number that he chose. I think he started first with one to, to see what would happen and people accepted it. So then he tried 21. Well, what if I excommunicate 21 men? What will happen? Well, there will be a rebellion. He excommunicated 21 men and there wasn't a rebellion. People just accepted what he said. I think it was a test 
And so what happens when he excommunicates these men, he just he deems them unworthy. He asks he asks men to provide him with a list. He'll say something like, God has told me that you have sinned. Now I need you to provide me a list of all of the sins you've committed and then compare your list with the list that God has given me. And then he uses that list as blackmail against them. So he has a list on everyone. And he just refers to that list when he wants to oust someone. And then what happens is that as a man is, con is deemed unworthy, he's excommunicated from the church, basically told he will spend his eternity in hell. Uh, he has to repent from afar, from something he doesn't even know what he's supposed to repent from. And in the meantime, his wives and his children are then assigned to another man who was deemed more worthy. Right. So you have these children, some of them who have grown up with a half a dozen different fathers. They don't know what their last name is. They have no identity at all. And the same thing with these women who are just traded around like livestock. And assume that the man they're with is going to be the one that takes them to heaven. Right. One more thing. Uh um, did War what did Warren Jeffs tell the group while he was gone? First of all, like say, like he's um, jacking off in prison, but then he told the entire group in the city not to have sex while he was in jail for life, and then how that changed back and forth, you know? Oh yeah, what's really interesting is while I was in Colorado City, uh, I started hearing this story about how Warren had told people that as long as he wasn't able to have relationships with his wives that none of the other people in the community in the FLDS were allowed to either. Two things, he's the only person that could perform marriages. So no marriages are being performed right now. The, this is great for the little girls. They might actually have a chance to grow up and have somewhat normal lives, at least to have a chance to get to be teenagers and enjoy their teenage years. Uh, so basically what he has said is no marriages as long as he's in prison and no relationships. And basically what he has told the people through his brother Lyle is that if I see any pregnancies that obviously happened after my prison date, you will be excommunicated. This is another test of his power and control over people. And what's interesting, while we were there, th we started hearing stories of men who were going into drugstores in the nearby cities and buying condoms so that they could have relationships with and their wives. Now, actually, Willie and the God Squad, people in the God Squad, can have to witness the sex with permission from the prophet in jail. They can have sex now as long as they get permission and, and as long as there's a witness. Well, that sounds